Good, uh, good evening, everybody, and warm welcome to today's lecture uh, that is entitled Ways of Alternatives Career in Public Engagement and the Excellence of Area Studies by Professor Heather Hindman. This lecture is organized by Social Science Baha and Association for Nepal and Human Studies Kathmandu Center. And my name is Jeevan, and I'm a researcher at Social Science Baha. It's my immense pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Heather Hinman for the lecture on behalf of Social Science Baha and Association for Nepal and Human Studies. Uh, today, I will also be uh, moderating uh, the lecture. Uh, Professor Heather is a good friend of Social Science Baha, um, and many of you I know. Although I have known her personally for about three years now through the annual Hima, uh, Nepal and Himalayan Conference, I think uh, uh, many of you uh, know her for quite a long time, and then her name is not new to us. Uh, and we have tremendous respect and admiration for you and your work. For those of you who don't know her and her work, she is now the Associate Professor of Asian Studies and Anthropology at the University of Texas Austin in the USA. Her interests include uh, gender, bureaucracy, entrepreneurialism, social theory, critical development, transnational labor and finance, as well as anthropology of garments and waste disposal sites. She is extensively published uh, in Anthropological Quarterly, Himalay, Studies in Nepal History and Society, Identities, the Journal for Popular Culture, and others, as well as several edited volumes. Pro Professor Hinman has several, uh, sorry, served for uh, several years as President of Association for Nepal and Himalayan Studies. And, she's also be, uh, uh, and she has also been the book review reviewer, uh, book review editor for Journal of Asian Studies for Comparative and Transnational Scholarship. Amongst uh, her several publications, she has published uh, Mediating the Global Expatriates Forms and Consequences in Kathmandu from Stanford, 2013. And she co authored Inside the Everyday Lives of Development Workers, The Challenges and Future of Aidland. Uh, Kumari in 2011. Likewise, she is also deeply invested in uh, graduate training, working with many PhD students in Department of Western Studies, as well as scholars in anthropology, radio, television, and films, sociology and <coughs> geography at the University of Texas, as well as several anthropology doctoral students in the US, UK, and Australia. She is frequently traveled to Asia for research and presentations. Recently, she visited SAI's program with Fatima Jinnah uh, Women's University, Pakistan, and Sichuan University in summer of 2017 for the International Symposium on Himalayan Studies. In today's lecture, she will be talking about how Nepalese desire for South Korean goods, uh, goods is shaped by the <coughs> idea of quality, which is to a larger extent also influenced by rumors that is circulated by migrants who go to South Korea basically for the work and for some other reasons as well. She will also discuss about reasons why South Korea holds an important places in the imagination of many of the Nepalese and what access to these uh, goods that is manufactured in South Korea means to Nepalese and their Korean dream. We all are delighted and are looking forward to listening to your lecture this evening uh, on the interesting subject for many of us here, certainly for someone like me who's lived in South Korea for about a uh, total almost uh, four years, two years as a student and subsequently as a migrant research, researcher. Um, uh, with this and further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Heather Hickman for the lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I feel like I should be um, 
co-giving this paper with Jivan because I think he knows about as much about this topic as I do, and I'm already looking forward to the research that we're going to be able to do together. Um, and I have to start this with an apology. I'm um, really thrilled to be here and honored to be presenting uh, via the Social Science Baja, but I'm also a little surprised as um, this opportunity came up about a week ago when I opened my laptop and said, what existed presentation do I have um, available to go that could be ready to go immediately? And this is what I have. Um, it was actually a talk that I gave most recently in China, so it was kind of oriented to people who might know the Korean context but wouldn't necessarily know the uh, Nepali context. So I'll try to sort of um, explain more about the Korea situation and less about the Nepal situation, which I know there are people in the room who know more than I do about this. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about the field work that we've been doing in Seoul um, as I can in the talk and in the Q&A. First, I want to talk about how I came to this topic. And I really come to this subject for a couple of different reasons, one of which I'll hold off on in a minute. But the first is that I think of myself as a globalization researcher more than anything. Um, and I think there's a tension right now in how we study globalization. Um, as I see it, globalization has gone through three phases, or at least our scholarship about globalization has gone through three, three phases. The first one, I think of as just the excitement over it, especially from a sort of progressive scholarly point of view. Look at all of the opportunities that global connection will offer. We'll all become more liberal. We'll learn more about other places. We'll expand our knowledge, and everybody will get along and um, know more about each other. Um, this was quickly or simultaneously followed by, oh no, globalization. The idea that um, as cultures became more connected, would, would they lose their uniqueness? Would cultural identity drift away? Would we all become McDonaldized, as it's said? And I think it's only in the past 10 to 15 years that we've gotten to sort of globalization 3.0, where we're actually looking at the particularity of situations, um, not looking at issues of being either overwhelmed or, um, uh, or sort of uh, dispersed in certain ways. So I think this new phase of globalization, where we're actually looking at globalization on the ground in particular contexts, is absolutely wonderful. I think the only problem is that the academy hasn't caught up with us yet. Um, the challenge for stage 3.0 of globalization for scholars, perhaps particularly of anthropology, is that, um, again, funding apparatuses and jobs haven't caught up with us yet. Uh, by and large, if you go to a conversation between two anthropologists, the first conversation you have is, where do you work? And the answer is supposed to be a nation state. And we haven't quite overcome that yet. As we apply for jobs or grants, they're almost always nation state bound. Um, I also think we're challenged to get beyond X plus Y. And this is something that I've tried to do in this talk. I'm sure you can catch me slipping back into it. Um, but I think even when we do get to actually existing global phenomena, we can too quickly uh, operate in nation state conundrums where we see what does Nepal look like in Korea, for example, rather than looking at the particularities. For example, in, uh, in terms of the EPS, which I'll talk about later as the contemporary form of Nepali migration, um, there's a predominance of names like Tam, Urum, um, you know, very few other names. Those are mother, um, a few rise. So thinking about how it is not Nepal and Korea, thinking about how in Korea a lot of the destinations for labor migrants aren't the capital of Seoul will break apart the sort of Nepal Koreanness of this, which my very first slide already falls back into. Talking about globalization as it appears on the ground rather than um, as it's being marketed. I think is important for us as scholars because globalization is for me a term that um, scholars no longer hold 
we no longer have possession of it. It's now out in the world. And we can hear businessmen and politicians talk about globalization. And I hear it more in that sort of means. So I want to also resist the idea of, for example, soft power, which is uh, Joseph Nye's concept um, on globalization. Where he's talking about how governments are using um, non-military forms of, of interaction. And I think that's useful, but I think we have to be critical as scholars to think about what's really going on on the ground and what soft power looks like um, in a more nuanced way. So this is a story of how, well, again, I want to say two nation states, South Korea and Nepal, but I'll try to resist that. Perhaps more importantly, scholars in those fields, because where I want to end up here is what hampered my Nepal-centric brain in looking at this phenomenon, and what happened, you know, what held back my co-researcher, who is a Korean scholar's mind in shape, thinking about Korea-Nepal relations. Um, academics often think about transnational relations, but we're often blind to how they look beyond our own area studies training. So with that, uh, today I want to talk about the imagination of other places and peoples as constructed by the flows between South Korea and Nepal while attempting to avoid the gification of particularly modernity narratives. So those sort of hierarchies that set all countries in a linear progression that seek to define all nation state engagements in that economic hierarchy. Nepal and Korea have their own history of exchange and understanding of the other, which often does not include Euro-America, and have their own participation in particular understandings of development and progress. I want to highlight also uh, the importance of collaboratory research, without which I don't think this scholarship would be possible. Um, this is maybe why I think it's so great to be giving this talk in conjunction with social science law, where collaboration is so emphasized. Unfortunately, in uh, the US Academy, we're all running around trying to single author our papers and prove that we're experts on everything, which we can't possibly be. Um, so I also want to nod to my colleague in this project, Robert Oppenheim, um, who is the Koreanist at stake here. Um, I want to say this while emphasizing the importance of deep grounding not only in language and area skills, but also understanding how phenomena are framed within the field of Nepali or Korean studies. I'll ultimately argue that this phenomena is seen within Nepal as a story of migration, and it's seen completely differently in Korea um, and by Korean scholars. Professor Oppenheim and I feel that this is more than a story of Hallyu. Hallyu is the word for Korean wave, and this is pretty much how our project gets shaped when we talk to Koreanists or transnational labor. So let me begin with consideration of how the Korean wave, Hallyu, did or did not crash into Kathmandu. Um, in 2010, and I could add that this phenomenon is repeated nearly every year I've visited, including this year, uh, but many of the pictures I'm going to show you are from 2010, 13, and 2007. Um, while visiting Kathmandu, I noticed images of Korea everywhere, like this one. Um, in restaurants, in paintings on the wall, in advertisements for language schools. Um, one only need read the newspaper, and we're in the middle of a Korean wave right now, we're in the middle of the EPS system, um, suggested what was then called the KLT, the Korean language test, uh, was being offered, and that this might uh, produce some of the reasons why Korea seemed omnipresent to me in Kathmandu. Um, for this particular audience, I suspect you're somewhat familiar with the EPS system, or at least you've seen the manifestations of it. All you have to do is look at a life poll and see the advertisements for language academies that will prepare you for the EPS exam um, or some of the other um, classes that are available to help prepare people. Read the newspaper. They'll talk about um, how many people passed and didn't pass. So it's, it's fairly common. Um, and we can talk more about the transition, as Jivan and I did uh, four or five days ago, um, between the ITS system, the industrial trainee system that governed Korea, Nepali migration to Korea um, from 1993 until 2008, um, 
there are kind of different ways of thinking about labor laws, and we can talk about that again later. So over a four-day period in 2010, more than 40,000 young Nepalis um, who were then and are now nearly all men. And you can see this um, in this newspaper. This is the second round of the EPS KLT exam. The first one was in 2008. Um, men stretching in a queue um, for all the way around the stadium and back down again for two days lined up to take this exam. And I looked up the number. It was apparently 75,000 this year. Um, and I think the numbers are significant because the, well, the number of applicants for the EPS test um, has gone up significantly. The number of passers has not, nor the number of people who are accepted for jobs has gone up, but not terribly significantly. And I think um, one also needs to know that the way this works, people who are not um, able to get jobs in one cycle are able to apply the next cycle. So we now have this backlog of people who are eligible to get jobs in Korea but haven't gotten them yet. So it's this backlog of successful applicants. Um, you can see from this newspaper article that um, the lines were snaking around the block. Um, and it always seems to happen on one of the hottest days of the year. So I think about every other year, somebody, multiple people pass out on the line just because it's so hot and all you have this baking in the sun. In, in every year this takes place, the ultimate goal of those who are waiting in this line was to work in South Korea. But after they get to the end of this line, all they get is a little piece of paper. What happens in the stadium is they are forced to pay a, a, a modest fee. I'm not quite sure what it is now. I think it was about 200 rupees in 2010. Um, prove their identification, give a photo, and they get a piece of paper that allows them to take the test um, that may allow them to go to Korea. Um, it's worth noting that all of these jobs that are available are in manufacturing, fishing, or farming with very few examples, and, or with very few exceptions. And again, 99% male. Um, this year, 75,000 um, people applied. There were 260 or so women who applied for the EPS mm. in 2016. Um, so all of the people who apply, so again, they've waited in line four hours, sometimes for the entire day. They get a form. Um, which enables them three months later to take a test. Um, the passing rate in 2010 was about 10%. Um, in 2014, it reached a particular <coughs> low of about 5%. It's up to about 7% now. So those 75,000 people, 70% <coughs> of them passed the exam, which allows them to get in line to get a job. Um, it, it's really a high stakes <coughs> game. So, um, a lot of these people that you see in this line are not going to end up with a job. And I think this is significant because relative to the Gulf states or even Malaysia, South Korea receives relatively few Nepali labor out migrants and plays a lesser role in Nepal's remittance economy. Um, I want to argue that the appeal of EPS is far from universal in Nepal. Um, and I guess my key argument is EPS, this Korean language system, and again, the test that they're waiting to take is a language-based test in Korean. Um, I understand they're considering implementing a skills-based test, but they're not going to do that until 2020. So this is a test merely to assert their language abilities. Um, articulates with Nepali logics of class habitus, and I think this is the most relevant issue to this article. Um, as I've argued elsewhere, EPS feels affectively very different than other forms of labor migration. EPS is, as I'll describe, um, it feels a lot more like preparation for overseas study than for work on Gulf construction projects. The ex furthermore, the expenses of time and money that are endured by applicants are also more parallel to study abroad than other forms of, out of overseas migrant labor. Ultimately, I argue that the disjuncture between the EPS system 
and manpower-mediated forms of labor is conditioned by South Korean ideas and aspirations to transparency, as well as the embeddedness of Nepali youth in the time past system. And just to unpack this a little, um, I think that the EPS system asks of Nepali youth certain forms of risk. Um, despite the fact that the advantage of the system is supposed to be that it's transparent and it doesn't involve the um, financial investment that overseas labor migration asks of uh, people who are going to the Gulf. It's not free. It's far from free. It's actually quite expensive. And that's why I emphasize the numbers so much. So to be an EPS aspirant, you basically have to be willing to flush 500 US dollars down the toilet. Thinking about the ways in which overseas labor migration to the Gulf works, you have to invest a certain amount, but you will get a job in the Gulf. It will be horrible. Um, on the other hand, if you invest money in the EPS process, 7% pass and not all of those get jobs. So I think that's worth thinking about, as well as the important role that education plays in Nepal. And I'm borrowing here from um, Craig Jeffrey's idea of time pass developed um, for the North Indian context, where he argues that in a situation of um, what I also call long-term provisionality that I think Nepal is in, um, many young people are seeing education as a way to suitably pass the time when they are not yet getting their career started, um, but it's not acceptable to just sit around the house. And EPS ends up looking a lot like education. Notwithstanding these limits, as well as some understanding of the difficulties of work in Nepal, uh, or in South Korea, I'm going to do that more than once, um, South Korean labor is uh, far preferable to Gulf work. Um, I, I keep remembering the statistics that 1.6 caskets come home from the Gulf every day. Um, that does not happen in Korea, and yet the work is incredibly hard. Um, the outside interest manifest in the waiting crowd that you see here is attributable in part to Korea's reputation as the $1,000 a month country, which is often how it's talked about on this line, um, and is not an altogether inaccurate estimation of the wages of an EPS position for a month. Um, it also sort of becomes this shorthand. Moreover, the system and the stampede it engendered, um, engendered outside cultural concomitant effects that extend beyond those eligible or participating. So it's more than just the line, more than just people who are actually um, getting into the EPS system. And I suggest that at particular moments, the EPS effect extends beyond um, this line or anybody applying. For those who make it to the end of the line on years when the EPS is administered, and it's not administered every year, um, they then have three months to pass the Korean language test. Uh, it's not an easy test. Uh, the logic coming out of Korea is that this is a safety measure. Um, but I've seen this test, and it's, it's far more than doc or watch out. Um, it is my perception that the EPS system is, and has from its inception been, deeply dependent upon past movements between the two countries. I wonder if Jivan could talk about that. Um, the EPS academies are staffed by those who formerly worked in Korea, either officially or unofficially. Furthermore, <laughs> other examples of Koreanness, such as restaurants, churches, alumni and alumni organizations, are recruited into participation um, in EPS preparation for aspirants. So think about this. Who's going to know Korean in Kathmandu? And right now, they just started giving the test in Pokhara in the last two years, but almost all the EPS aspirants are coming out of Kathmandu somehow or another. Um, who's going to know Korean well enough to prepare them? Some Koreans, but that doesn't seem to be other than um, Koika, the Korean aid agency, does run a Korean language program. But um, there is far more demand than there is supply, and that one's not inexpensive. Who's available to teach Korean? Well, it's either people who were formerly employed there or people who have somehow been abroad. Um, and I think this is the direction that we'll be going in our research, is looking at all of the links of different Korean mobilities um, or Nepali mobilities to Korea, 
Um, I think there was a recent scandal about how remittance funding was coming back to uh, Nepal from Korea. It was often coming through informal means, but it was often coming through informal means via the trading goods. So these Korean stores that I showed you earlier are actually participants in the EPS system as people um, don't remit cash, they sometimes remit blankets or other Korean goods. One of the places that the EPS explosion is best seen is in Bog Bazaar, which um, does have a half dozen or so stationary stores, which seem to have lots of, of um, Korean boy band goods, as well as Japanese um, chalkies and Hello Kitty stuff. Um, but it's also the uh, frequent by students and is the center of Japanese language training and overseas study industry, as you all well know. Um, and I think, I won't go into too much detail about this, but you can think about the ways in which this is sort of a clash. Um, if we take Bog Bazaar itself as a microcosm, most of the industry there is around education, which sort of taps into my claim about time pass, or preparation to study abroad. And so the third group here are groups of people going to work in factories in Korea, which is ultimately the destination. And these are very things with a very different class perception um, in Nepal. Thus, I argue that a disciplinary aspect of the EPS system, its insistence on Korean language, and the projects of self-preparation by applicants that this engenders, drives Korean language study here in Kathmandu. Beyond language study itself, however, the EPS, and more broadly, past and present circuits of labor migration to South Korea have a significant cultural spillover. Um, so we witnessed a lot of situations where Korean restaurants during this three-month EPS intense period um, were acting as uh, Arizot's language academies that young EPS uh, aspirants would come into Korean restaurants and uh, try to get the owners of the restaurants to sometimes teach them language, more often teach them something about <laughs> Korean culture, um, or somehow give them a sense of any um, tool they might use to get a leg up on um, this, this test that, um, again, is so challenging for so many. Other Kathmandu out outposts of Korea have become magnets in similar ways, and Korea you can find is frequently discussed in newspapers. Um, at the end, I want to talk about a binational exhibit, um, but I'll wait on that. Another phenomenon illustrative of deeper ties between labor histories and Kathmandu's cultural landscape was the Korean or the Kathmandu shops that specialized in Korean goods um, that we also investigated. So um, the top two are good examples here, particularly the, the ant collection, which um, sells goods that come directly from Korea. And I think we've written about this elsewhere, but I think it's significant that if you can see that Korean shawl, muffler, blanket, and snack and foods in wholesale and retail, these aren't Hallyu goods. This isn't Korean pop culture that's being sold. It's, it's blankets and sweaters and shoes. Um, you can go down to Kantipath and see one of the more prominent Korean shops. Um, and I think this is valent not not as Korea as a Hallyu fetish, but Korea as um, quality, as a particular aspirable economic condition, but one that's actually attainable by people at a decent price. So while the EPS itself is too young to be implicated in this phenomenon, um, we found that Korean owners and managers of this shop actually had a long history of engagement with, or Nepali owners of these shops had a long history of engagement with Korea. Um, they were often um, informal migrants or had studied there or had a cousin who studied there. So thinking about this not as the EPS in isolation, but as a network of reasons why Nepalese might have a connection to Korea. And the tourism industry is certainly a part of that as well. Looking at this from the Korean side, we found significant fluidity among Nepalese moving to Korea, many of whom had come on student visas and then shifted categories to extend their time in Korea by working on business visas. Um, they might have also been working there without visas, um, but not wanting to tell us that, which I can understand. And I hope to investigate next, because we saw a lot of 
people in the language academies that had been part of the ITS system, the one that existed before EPS, and gotten kicked out of Korea for overstaying. Um, I'm particularly interested in the people from the first two cohorts of EPS, um, which according to the EPS, there are only about 5,000 Nepalis who have returned from this program. Um, what they're ending up doing, how they're shaping this. I'm going to skip this discussion of how long it is that people are able to stay, but suffice to say the EPS system participates in this, particularly this is why bureaucracy is one of my interests. Um, bureaucratic, rational, a word I use in quotes, transparent, a word I also use in quotes, system um, of trying to make this easy and clear for Nepalis, and yet my argument is that it is in no way easy or clear, um, and can in fact be very punitive. Um, it is intended to make things clearer and not um, punitive, but it has a problem. So we can talk more about that, but it is very limited in duration. Um, I'm particularly interested in the fact that apparently 35 is still the cutoff year, and um, if you're over 35, you not only can't apply to this program, but um, you have to come home, and many people cycle in a number of times. So we can talk about the cycling back and forth as well. Um, so here's one where I want to shift to some of the Korea perspective on this. When I've discussed the EPS system and the meaning of Korean goods in Kathmandu with Koreanist scholars, the phenomena, everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. You're talking about Hollywood. Um, you're talking about the Korean wave, and you're participating in this long-standing discussion um, that Korea sees its um, popular culture as one of its most important exports, and in particular, it's um, in particular to East Asia and other realms of Asia. There's some unintentional aptness, I would argue, in how you mean in Korean wave metaphor in Nepal, where um, it does take on a wave characteristic. Um, we've been trying to play with the idea of, of Korean wave, of the waxing and waning of Korean interest that cycles with the EPS system. With the Korean government, um, the other thing that um, Nepali presence in um, Korea resonates with when I talked previously about this is multiculturalism or this Tanghwa uh, phenomena. So the Korean government is actively engaging in producing these uh, multicultural fairs and local villages um, that actually aren't that attractive to Nepali workers from what I've found. Um, the Tamanwa phenomena really has a lot more to do with anxiety about Korean uh, monoculture as well as the rise of foreign lives in Korea. I don't want to overstate this point, but to me it's been a remarkable phenomenon as Koreanists know exactly what I'm talking about and slot Nepali interest in the country in Hallyu or this Tamanwa. Um, well, whenever I present in, uh, to a Nepali scholar's audience, they see this as part of the narrative of overseas labor. Um, we've talked a little bit about the bureaucracy of the EPS system, which I think is important um, for this audience because I think the attempt to remove um, mediators, and as we talked about at the SSB conference, the important role of mediators and dalals in all of this is what the Korean government wanted to exclude and in fact won an award for um, government transparency in 2011 from the UN appears not at all transparent to many people who might aspire to labor migration. Um, we collected a lot of horror stories in Korea about the public laborers who went abroad, a number of whom anticipated as master's degrees holders that they would be doing something other than working in factories or working on um, fishing ships, which often went out for six months at a time, um, and then found that that was actually the job they're doing. Likewise, we found lots of people who had spent nearly a lifetime um, in Korea as, as Nepalis moving around from category to category. And one of the best stories we found was from a guy who had worked there as a student, then started to run a restaurant, uh, married, had a kid, and his wife was giving him the hardest time because he apparently had said every year, I want to go home to Nepal next year and take care of my mother who's aging. Um, and he swore that next year was going to be the year, and his wife said, yeah, sure, I've heard that every year for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so I think, you know, there are different experiences that people have, and there's certainly 
the Tamanoa phenomena is attempting to address some of the prejudice that the Nepalis experience when they get there. Um, I'm going to skip this section, which talks about how um, sort of ethnic categories uh, feed differently. I think Korea feeds nicely into the Mongol look um, in Nepal, and in particular, I think Koreanness and the aesthetic of Koreanness peaks um, and falls with uh, hostility to India in part. There's a final layer that attention to a multi-area perspective affords for consideration of the gaps of perception that are entailed by our continued nation state organization. Towards the end of 2010, um, while researching in Kathmandu, we visited this art exhibit, uh, Propagation, which brought together artists from South Korea and Nepal. And we thought this installation was particularly um, emblematic, although we're still working out of what. Um, I'll let Jiva act this later if he feels like it, but um, it's an image of a young Korean boy in Nepal and a uh, less young uh, Nepali guy in, um, in Korea and a can of corned beef in the middle, um, which actually resonates a lot with, with Korea in ways that might not be legible. I'm not going to talk about cannibalic protests. Um, yeah. But I will say that I think this is an ongoing phenomena in Korea and Nepal having their own engagements and resonances that might not have to do with Euro America. Um, and I'm always looking at these because um, there's a famous anecdote that in 1951, um, Nepal gave foreign aid to South Korea, to Korea. Um, and this always stands as an emblem for many economists, political scientists, of look what Korea has done in 60 years. Nepal should be able to do this. So it sort of sits in this particular economic position for many people in Nepal. Um, I want to focus on the end here about to the parallel um, excisions, blindnesses that we have, um, which became obvious when I was looking at this phenomena as a, someone with a lot more experience in Nepal than Korea, and my, my collaborator, uh, Robert Oppenheim, was looking at this very much from a Korean's background. Um, we have <coughs> feet planted in two geographies and two scholarly discourses, and we began to understand that a lot of how we were framing this was based not only on the phenomena, but more on what we expected to see coming from our own area discourse. Um, this multi-sided perspective revealed to us that um, the contextual location of wants and desires and love for Korean media products, which Korean scholars were like, yes, we know exactly what you're talking about, um, didn't take account of what produced these desires. Because of course, desires are produced. Um, from Korea, it was, oh, well, of course they'll like our culture because, well, we're awesome. And from Nepal, there seemed to be a much more complex economic, social reason that might motivate these reasons. Um, so the cultural presence of South Korea in Nepal, and likely analogous areas, was compared by Korean <laughs> scholars to soft power, to Hollywood, to multiculturalism. Likewise, the EPS system was seen as part of attempts to reform, you know, the EPS system in, in Nepal was seen as um, an attempt to improve the labor migration situation um, and part of a larger system of attempting to bring good governance, which is one of Korea's main outreaches to Nepal, to Nepal, um, emerging from a more quote-unquote developed nation. Yet, in this project, we have found that where you stand, not just on the globe, but in the academy, matters a great, great deal to what you see and how your gaze is focused. And here, with an SSB audience, I can see how this project was very easily dovetail into the work of the Center for the Study of Labor and Mobility and some of the research that Jivan and his colleagues have done. And yet when I gave a similar version of this paper in a workshop of Korea, they immediately signed me to the collection of papers on Hollywood. These scholarly contexts as well as the regional familiarity, and I want to stress again that we have to um, applaud our, our area knowledge but also expand it, shape the way we see these phenomena. Um, as much as economy or nation state politics. So, with that, let me wrap up and thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Professor Hizman. Uh, thank you for that exciting and insightful presentation. Uh, now I would like to uh, open the floor, but before that I would like to request uh, all of you uh, to be succinct and brief in your questions uh, so that everybody gets a chance to ask questions. Uh, in the first time I would like to take three four questions. My name is Sogya Mekri, uh, I'm a student of social science also. I want to ask you your research, uh, I like it very much on the context of that. But uh, you, you see this, uh, the way the project you have prepared, uh, it is a little debatable. Why it is debatable? You see this research project from Mongolian microscope or a whole world context of Nepalese school. That is debatable, number one. And you, you have to take one Mongolian perspective and another is from this uh, Mongolian common perspective. But it is not a broad context. <coughs> Nepal is a very big country and uh, you have not seen from uh, only one little perspective, from indigenous perspective. That is only I, have, I want to mention. Perspective of indigenous. indigenous. So, anybody else? related to security concern because from uh, what we can see like in terms of permanent migrants it's looked at or in, even in terms of contemporary migrants it's usually looked at in terms of uh, really in relation to social integration and the ease with which they can so integrate into the rest American who lived in southwestern states for 30 years in the USA, Texas, Arizona, and California. My question is a bit broader. Let's just uh, look at your quote. Our culture is our identity. Uh, American President Donald Trump is very, very protective of his con country and culture and economy. He wants to build a wall um, in the Mexican border. 
He wants to curtail actually immigration of uh, Mexicans. Mm -hmm. BJP nationalist India is also paranoid about diluting their culture. Uh, so are some nationalists here in Nepal too. They are also were worried about dilution of it's the economy that basically takes a poor country, people from poor country like Nepal, we go outside, that includes me, some of us come back, one of them is me. My actually question, so the, the whole, the process of negative, negativism and plus and minus, uh, I'm just looking at a broader picture of even US, India, Nepal, I mean, Nepal and Korea is a very, very small number. I mean, but I just want to Can get a, a the broader feel for uh, what your thoughts are. Thank you. Thank you so much for these uh, great questions, some of which I'll be able to uh, answer, some of which I will have to say, um, and this is particularly the first question. Um, I think the issue of uh, again, where I open the fact that this should never be seen as a Nepal Korea project, and yet that's the way I perpetually describe it, um, is incredibly important. The common law celebrations that you do see um, are always depicted by Koreans as celebrations of Nepali culture, but then um, who shows up are the um, Magar Association, the, the, the Limbu Association. It's not although you saw all of the guys had on their, their two triangle t-shirts representing Nepal, um, but I think there is a real problem in how um, all Nepalis in Korea are perceived as Nepalis, and yet their own self-identification often is much more either with um, a regional group or um, actually in the moment of the earthquake, it was around hometowns. So almost all of the uh, Nepali workers in Korea at the time of the earthquake and soon after were uh, doing benefits for their hometowns. So it can't be seen as a Nepal-Korea um, issue, even as I accidentally slip into that. I'm going to have to keep working on that and exploring um, how this exchange of, in this case, people, um, is very unevenly distributed um, across Nepal. Um, thank you for the questions on why language is so important because um, uh, on the one hand I'm just going to give the, the lazy excuse of please read my article in Anthropological Quarterly on this, um, but just to describe it briefly, from a Korean perspective language is um, a great way to delineate quality and almost more than that testing is. Um, it's an incredibly test-driven situation whereby um, how do you determine how you're going to accept someone when there are more people who want a position than you can accept? Um, there are a lot of different ways. You can pick the short straw. Um, in many cases, even when language is irrelevant, in Korea those distinctions are made based upon English language testing. Even when you don't need English. So the idea that how we can not randomly, but how we can select with some uh, nuance who's going to get these opportunities is driven by um, language. And I think um, the point that was made of that this is not about social integration at all. The EPS system is explicitly designed as the ITS system was, but the EPS is even more so. There is no way that, according to the system, you should ever be integrated into Korea. The assumption is you are going home, and there are very fixed terms, three years plus one year and ten months, not two years, one year and ten months, with the possibility of a, of a second term renewal. Um, but the idea that you would be integrated and become part of Korea, not possible. And actually that's some of the reason why the Tamanwa system exists as well, um, because there's an increasing number of usually Southeast Asian women who are coming to marry Korean rural men. And that was the first place that Korea kind of had to come to grips with its own idea of nobody can possibly become Korean, nobody can possibly be socially integrated, and yet we're having to come to terms with that. Korea's kind of having to come to terms with that a bit, 
but still the expectation is never that anybody would be learning Korean in order to integrate into this society. Um, nor is it altogether the idea of getting rid of a mediator. Learning Korean language is, in many of the jobs that these men end up doing, pretty much unnecessary. Um, again, we've been to some of the workplaces, we've seen some of the trainings that um, the Nepalis who are successful go through in Korea, and um, some of the, I think most of the emphasis on language comes from the Korean idea of what quality is and the importance of language, but I think some of it comes from an incident that I believe happened in 2006, um, I don't know if you remember this, I'm not sure if I'm remembering the details correctly, where an Nepali, well, it might not have been a Nepali, but a guy got hit on the head by a falling beam. Uh, and the, the outcry was, we need to teach people Korean so they can be aware <coughs> when we shout duck or watch out. And yet the EPS system and its, its predecessor, the KLT, is <coughs> so much more complex than that. Um, it's so much more detailed than that. So I don't think it's about altogether getting rid of a mediator so that people can work in Korean. Um, even though many people become very good, I'm not sure you could get that good based merely on the test, nor do I think that's the expectation. Um, it isn't one of integration or residency. Um, you asked about the discourse of transparency, and this is one that I don't think I ever heard an EPS worker talk about, but when we visited with Korean officials who are participating in this test, um, they talked about it a lot. Um, and in particular, um, there was a lot of discussion about this 2011 UN award um, for this system being one of the most transparent. And it is very much in response to, I would say, two different things, one of which will become, will be somewhat familiar. I mean, there is a ton of exploitation in transnational labor migration. This comes as a shock to no one. Um, and certainly there's an investment in um, mitigating that. Yeah, I think there are also um, a few other things at stake in how the Korean government is thinking about transparency and its attempts to bring good governance, some of which have to do with um, computerizing the system, um, some of which have to do with, again, eliminating uh, the laws, um, yeah, um, and, and some of which have to do with sort of trying to be a leader on the world stage and bring new forms of governance to the world um, that work a little differently. Um, I, I, I think that transparency key in the way in which the Korean government participates in a global discourse on transparency is incredibly important. Um, and yet I would argue that this is an incredibly untransparent system to most of the people who are applying for it. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the MOU, the, the Memorandum of Understanding, that, by the way, is the same across all 12 countries that participate in the system, substituting the, the word Bangladesh for Korea or um, the, the word, you know, uh, Uzbekistan for Korea, all of those, or for Nepal, they're all exactly the same. Um, popular culture, is it relevant at all? Yeah. I mean, I think it's more of an issue of, um, again, trying to find alternative popular cultures. The other thing we did a certain amount of is go around to Korean hairstyling salons, uh, which are all over uh, Kathmandu in particular, and, and talk to people about how, um, why Korean hairstyles are, are salient. And I think a lot of them were about uh, not K-pop in the sort of band sense, but in a alternative to Euro America or India. Um, in fact, we have a, a lovely discussion from a woman who explained that um, Nepali hair, and in fact it was Nepali that she was talking about rather than delineating between Nepali hairs, but Nepali hair is more suitable to, that idea of suitable um, from Mark Lippi is more suitable to Korean styles. Um, so I think that's where you see it more, more so than um, what Korea thinks it's sending out in Hollywood, which is, which is boy bands. Although you can actually find, what, what we found more of than anything was movies, um, action movies from Korea. Um, and I can't really say anything to defend Trump 
or talk about um, nationalism. Um, I, I, I appreciate your perspective that it shouldn't be seen as a zero-sum game. And I think you're pointing to something that, again, the Tongan Hua tradition, the idea of thinking about multiculturalism is trying to grapple with right now, defending the nation and its identity versus alterity, which is you know, a part of all of our experiences. And yet, um, that's why I think doing actual research is important, because I don't think we can answer that question generally. I think we have to answer it specifically in terms of the resonances of different places to how they think about their others. So I think whatever um, is at stake in the U.S. is dealing with alterity. It's very different than what either Nepal or Korea or India is approaching when they're dealing with difference. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I collect another round of questions here? I just uh, wanted to know that uh, uh, you mentioned that the uh, uh, indigenous peoples. I just wonder uh, what the percentage of indigenous peoples involvement uh, in Korea and non-indigenous peoples. What is their, uh, you know, status in the position that? Uh, I also wanted to know that uh, why the uh, Korean government had chosen, chosen to Nepali, uh, you know, uh, deal with the Nepali government. That is the indication that they uh, or maybe Korean has also agreement. Korean government has also agreement with the other uh, countries. That is one. Of the Any other question? second half of your question more effectively than the first half of your question. I think um, in, in my research, the, the percentage of the indigenous population or the percentage of participants in the EPS system is fairly high. Um, I would say better than 50%. Um, on the other hand, many of the other pathways to Korea, study abroad, um, Korea also runs a robust trainings program that brings um, Nepali government workers or Nepali um, uh, private sector workers to Korea. And these networks are all deeply enmeshed with one another. So um, you might have somebody who would come abroad on a training sponsored by Koika or the Korean government, um, then induce their son or daughter to get a degree in Korea and sort of perpetuates a network going back and forth, um, I, which I think is an example of it being thoroughly untransparent, but you have to know a little bit about the system to get in. Um, those people are much less likely um, to be indigenous, um, those people who are coming through those sort of official pathways in many cases. Um, and then it's something we need to explore a bit more. Why deal with the Nepali government? This is a really important question. Um, from the Korean government perspective, it is working government to government that will eliminate the private sector middlemen. And it will be then transparent and fair and official. And the Korean government, in fact, um, punishes both the Nepali government and aspiration, you know, people who want to take the EPS test if the Nepali government doesn't keep up its end of the bargain. Um, the MOU clearly sets up that the Nepali government has to administer the test with all possible review, make sure there's absolutely no cheating or external money making anywhere in the system. Um, it's, it's the responsibility of the Nepali government to sort of shape all of this exchange. And that's true again for all of the countries that the EPS MOU covers. So um, the Korean government is also dealing with the Bangladeshi government in terms of how they negotiate this exchange. And the expectation is by dealing with government to government that there will be transparency and that they will eliminate those middlemen. You can certainly question if that happens, as I do deeply, um, but that's certainly how the Korean government sees it and sees themselves as getting around these long-standing 
networks of exploiters in the manpower services by utilizing the fair and transparent government. Thank you. Uh, is there any question or comment from anybody? No? Uh, I think I have uh, two questions, since we have a little bit of time. Uh, let me take uh, uh, use of that time. Uh, I agree with the fact that the career language training in Nepal is not working uh, for many reasons. Um, because on the one hand, they don't have uh, you know, uh, skilled careers. Uh, on the other hand, the kind of language that they learn uh, doesn't really apply when they uh, go abroad. Mm -hmm. But in my informal meetings with the government officers, uh, you know, when I talk about these issues, they never care about these uh, things. So maybe uh, it would be interesting for uh, researchers to understand why the uh, uh, Nepal government is reluctant to scrap these or make some kind of negotiations with the Koreans. On the other hand, Koreans also know about these things. Mm -hmm. So my question here would be uh, whether you or uh, Robert Oppenheim, your collaborator, uh, collaborator has done mm -hmm. that kind of you know, assessment about to what extent it's working in the workplace in, uh, in South Korea. Um, and then I think uh, it was around 2005 and 6 that there have been negotiations uh, between the civil society actors in South Korea uh, and the government at that time about setting these requirements, uh, basically dealing with government to government for this EPS program. Uh, I don't know whether you brought those issues uh, into context in your paper because you didn't talk about these things. Uh, I think we need to discuss about these things when we talk about why there was a question about the government deals with the government. Maybe it was because more because the Nepal government wanted rather than the Korean government wanted some transparency, transparency in the process. As far as I can recall, there was tensions um, and uh, problems between uh, different political parties and uh, these uh, member agencies about how this electoral process should go ahead. Thank you. It's always intimidating as far as the field um, sitting right next to you. Um, but you've given me a great opening to talk about a number of things. Um, you know, as you suggest, uh, um which is the uh, the Korean aid agency, the Korean um, uh, USAID, uh, does sponsor a fairly rigorous Korean language training where about 40 students a year are able to get trained, drop in the bucket. Um, I ultimately think, as I somewhat was trying to say in answer to Tracy's question, that um, learning language is ultimately irrelevant to this process, and the language that's learned in these tests um, isn't to make people better workers, to enable them to engage with Korea without interaction. Um, one of my favorite, first of all, we, we did do a rather inappropriate, vicious unpacking of, the, of one of the EPS textbooks, um, which the Korean in it was just absolutely awful um, and wouldn't have been communicable to anybody. So I ultimately think that this is about passing a test. Um, they could have been passing a test in almost anything just happened to be a Korean language in this case because of um, Korea's own fascination with language and testing. You ask why the Nepali government is reluctant to push back. Um, you know, one answer is that these are darn good jobs ultimately, and I think uh, many people recognize that this is a lot better employment situation than a lot of uh, jobs. But I also think that the Korean government has made it very hard to push back because um, Again, this MOU system is take it or leave it. We've, we've written an MOU with all governments. We just substitute your country's name in there. Where the Nepali government does have some negotiating room is increasing the number of Nepalis who, who are given jobs in any given year through the EPS system. And that is dependent in part upon the Nepali government maintaining this system of 
transparency in this, but it's also dependent upon um, Nepali's coming back. And a lot of what engendered the EPS system, the move out of the ITS, the industrial trainee system, was Nepali overstay. Um, and so there's a way in which um, one generation of Nepali workers in Korea um, is held hostage to the next generation. So if the, the past cohort doesn't come back at a high enough percentage, the Korean government knocks down the number of workers that they, that they accept into the program. I will say that um, Nepal has been seen as a model citizen in this. Um, that uh, Nepal has been rewarded with an increasing number of jobs. That is an increase of 50 to 100 per year. So again, 75,000 is still a drop in the bucket. Um, but ultimately, the Korean government sees the Nepali government as a good actor. Um, you're right, transparency, that's what I meant to say in answer to Laura's question, what we talked about four or five days ago. Unions. Um, what, what brought about the EPS system in Korea, I think, is 90% Korean unions. Um, that's why the, the no FTA is up there as well. Um, that protest is all about um, Korea's signing of certain free trade agreements, FTA, um, which was protested by the incredibly strong unions. And um, uh, Jivan and I were swapping stories about the largest migrant trade union, the MTU, the Migrant Trade Union, which I think for the past 12 years has had a Nepali as its president. Um, the, the unions and the unions' connection to migrants is incredibly strong. The ITS system was seen not as the gentleman might, might the gentleman who's sitting in front, uh, Professor Sharma, I believe, was suggesting it wasn't a story of their taking our jobs as it might be in America. It was actually a fight for migrant workers to have similar rights to Korean workers. So the ITS system didn't provide, let's say, health insurance for workers who did so at a much less um, advantageous rate than what um, Korean workers would get. The EPS system is explicitly believes that it's giving migrant workers exactly the same um, rights. Things like, um, again, the right to protest, the right to, um, to confront your employer, the right to health care that a non-migrant laborer would get. So I think a lot of what um, motivates the way in which the EPS system is shaped is less um, anything coming from Nepal and more anxiety about a domestic market and a domestic media um, that perceives is not, is hostile to alterity but isn't hostile to outside workers. Um, no, no regime to talk about um, difference um, and, in fact, a real um, ethnic homogeneity. On the other hand, an openness to workers from other places because of the low reproduction rate, um, but a desire that they be treated decently. And, and a particular, I shouldn't say that because, again, it's like transparency. It's a particular idea of what decent means to have the same rights that a Korean would. Uh, thank you, Professor Hinden. Um, now I think we are coming to the end of this lecture series. Um, before I end today's event, uh, I would like to provide a small gift from Social Science Baha to Professor Hinden. Uh, I hope you would uh, receive it. I would love to. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to uh, announce that today's event has uh, concluded and I would like to thank everybody here who made it to uh, the event, uh, even within the short notice. So we hope we will meet uh, in some other uh, events, yeah. occasions. Uh, thank you, thank you once again, thank you Professor Hinden. And thanks to uh, the staff of Social Science Baha. Yes. Thank you.